there's other ways of managing like Larry Cobius and this is where I have to rely on Dick. In the summertime, Larry Cobius Normally it's not there, but what we're finding now that we're getting them more and more, it's looking like it does in Seattle where they're out all year long. But typically. Typically they're not there. They're in the soil. Yeah. Right. In, in, 20, in 2010, a former student of mine was doing an internship or something with the Forest Service out of Asheville. And, and they were, it was a summer survey. And they put these collection <laughs> funnels around the bases of a number of different trees in Valley Cruces Park where the beetles had been. Bud Mayfield. Really, Bud May, yep, he was yeah. Bud's in, intern. So I would go out, you know, former student invites me. I was like, hey, I'm sampling for this beetle. So he had left these traps out. We would go. Huh, nothing, huh, nothing, huh, nothing. All summer long, he came back, I don't know, eight different times during the summer and was not finding beetles. So I think that sort of data collection during the wrong time of the year, you know, as researchers, they, you know, they, they you know, it's not that they have blinders on, they're going by the data. Right. There, was, there were no beetles collected. So XXX, Laracobius isn't working right. until later. Right, because it's a fall, winter, yep. active, diligence. this is all active fall, mm -hmm. mostly active fall, winter, spring. Right. And But anyhow, I was saying like, so if you have hedge that you want to spray, you know, um, you're probably better off to do it in the summer and do you something like soap or something that's not, that doesn't have a, a residual, like a lot of this chemi chemistry lingers on the foliage, these systemics especially. Um, so you could go in there and use something like oil or soap. But, you know, the bad thing to me about oil or soap is it is a non-discriminatory, like, it'll kill a lot of stuff. You know, um, a lot of these insecticides are, it's like chemo, it, well, it is chemotherapy, right, for the tree. But they're, just like with people, tree chemistry and agricultural chemicals are becoming more targeted. Um, and there's things like uh, insect growth regulators that are very soft on predators. So there's a really, it's hard to give a general answer, but I do think you could integrate some, you know, sort of common sense practice into doing treatments. And that's kind of what we do with integrated pest management. Um, a product like Safari, which is a, another neonicotinoid, it's very short-lived in the tree. So you could use something like Safari to have a less of a lingering effect. Um, and you can spray it on the bark instead of putting it in the soil. And there's all this sort of science that evolves with it. And, you know, I like trees and I like science. I like the science of the chemistry and I like the science of the, of the biology with the pests. So, um, you know, over time, you know, what has proven to us just, you know, is that um, going out with Dick and now going out by myself, you know, I carry my little bee cheat with me all the time now and I do find Laracobius everywhere. So I have to say to my customer, all right, customer, you know, we treated these trees with chemicals 10 years ago. Now I'm back to talk to you about it again. Boom, boom, boom. Here's some predators. What do you think we should do? Some of my clients, I don't even bring it up because I just know they don't want that story. I'm like, they, just, they want the trees to be chemically treated. Um, but most people, I will open that story, and then I, wind, then I really confuse them. And they're like, oh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> should I not treat the trees or treat the trees? Should and then I, I can, or should I go? Yeah, and then I can get involved and say, well, I think we should maybe treat these, and let's leave these alone. And it is a good idea if you want to kind of have your cake and eat it too. Um, to treat some that are really important to you that you just can't afford to you lose because it's a short-term treatment relative to the you know our life and everything so eventually it's gonna wear off and I'll die they'll die and you know maybe Larry Cobius will be really built up by then and it'll come back in so if it satisfies you to, to, to go ahead and treat some then you know I, I don't have a problem with it of course I've made a major part of my living treating trees which am I done no uh, you're getting, you're getting uh, you know and and so we but but so Dick you know this it's very exciting and you know like I said the scientists the entomology schools the forestry schools ISA people are really looking at us here 
because this is where it sort of started and it's mostly because Dick lives here um, and we had the ability to use Grandfather Mountain Country Club's uh, resources money right uh, and the, all these clubs you know that have invested money in them because Hound Deers has put a lot of money in Jan Lassi, um, Grandfather I mean all up and down 105 there's been a lot of uh, chemical and biological you know treatments but then people will say to me well should I buy some of these beetles and the answer is yes and no because it's like if kind of like if you you know build it they will come because when we go around and we start looking and we find them well they're there you know and if you want to spend some money and try to purchase a few which it pretty much has a corner on the market um, you can't really buy these commercially yet um, very difficult to rear this in a lab um, but you know they are coming in and if you want to try to buy some and put them in you know that's only going to make it better story goes on and on and on like I said they do a three-day symposium because you know the hope is that you can add maybe a summer predator to this which there's work with that and we've worked with a bunch and um, and that you'll have two or three different good bugs eating the bad bugs um, which brings me to so we've, we've been talking about hemlock for years and now what I talk about a lot with people is emerald ash borer, and that that's not on the agenda, but I got to sneak it in. Emerald ash borer, right? So we're under siege right now, emerald ash borer, yeah. and uh, there is a predator of emerald ash borer. Um, emerald ash borer is not; it, it is chemically treatable, but. Um, ash is not a major component of our forest and it's not a tree that we really plant as an ornamental they do in other parts of the world or, or the united states it's a big street tree um, but emerald ash borer is a non-native insect which is sort of what we thought hemlock woolly does it is you know it comes in and it exclusively feeds on ash and it is a killer and you'll start seeing ash dying they're dying now um, but if you know of any ash trees that are what you know what I would describe as a, um, a specimen or you know when I talk to people about trees in their yard I my, one of the first things I'll say is you know well it's a hemlock or whatever I'll say is this tree adding value to your property or your life somehow and if they say yes then we talk about this direction if they say no we talk about it in another direction because if it's not a really a valuable tree to you then a chainsaw is a great cure for all these non-native pests you know no hemlock no adelgid no problem um, no ash you know no ash borer so tree really has to be adding value to your property and and to you um, to do a treatment but this is a treatable condition emerald ash borer and it takes you know an in a direct injection of insecticide um, but more in over the next probably five years we'll start seeing a lot more ash trees yeah. um, dying unfortunately and then there's other I saw my first uh, it, actually Jerry uh, in the back showed me my first emerald ash borer there were a uh, ash trees around the softball field there in in Newland yeah. I popped the, the bark off and there's the and there's the yeah. crawler, there's the larvae. They're now, they've now been removed. It took me five years to get them to cut it down. And they finally cut it down later on. Now they're all dead, they spread out. They spread the emerald ash borer really well. <laughs> um, so they cut them down and then they, and finally they burned them, so. Yeah. And that's an example of the government going from complete quarantine, we can keep it out, to sorry about your luck. Yeah, well yeah. A lot of ash wood so you can carry it in firewood you know your tree dies you cut it up then you take your firewood from uh, somewhere around in Illinois to the race NASCAR race in Bristol <laughs> and uh, the APHIS guys are walking around you know I think those are the guys that like carry guns and they're like where'd this firewood come from <laughs> you know 
So there's a big campaign about not moving firewood. You guys, what about so that? From all of what you are saying, we have emerald ash. I have lots of hemlocks on our property, and there's a lot of, you know, the bad stuff. Yeah. So when they're dead, we're supposed to cut them down and burn them? Because I've got all lots, the, of, lots of All the emerald ash, yes, because the yeah. emerald ash borer can survive. But southern pine beetle, you can cut down the tree, and the, and the beetles get mixed up, couldn't get out of the tree. They've actually chipped ash trees, and the beetles continue their life cycle and came out in adults. So an emerald ash borer, you've got to burn it because the beetles will find a way. Okay. And if you want to know if you have it, you just go outside in June, wear, wear a purple shirt, and if you have emerald ash borer, it'll light right on you. Uh, yeah. But then the hemlock, but with all my woolly delta, I just leave it and yeah. leave it. For some treatments, you know, the Park Service and U.S. Forest Service, you know, they were they were as concerned about hemlock woolly adelgid, but they, you know, in some of these campgrounds, uh, you know, Big River down at, uh, at at Catalucci, their campgrounds were underneath three to four to six hundred year old hemlocks that were starting to die. So the liability for that, you know, I, it, when the top of a six hundred or four hundred year old you know hemlock breaks off and smashes you know eight cars in the parking lot they, it, it, it it was sort of a you know they prioritized those key trees but i don't think they burned any hemlocks because of adelgid it's more but with, with the ash borer for sure and yeah we treated ash trees at grandfather mountain state park and there's some treated at um, mount jefferson state park and about every three years you need to retreat them Till this big wave of borer sort of passes through and runs out of food basically we're protecting individuals um, and right now we're trying to come up with the money which is hard to do with the state to retreat them but once you initiate treatment on an ash tree you've kind of committed to this 10-year treatment cycle to protect the tree but then you can kind of back off of treatments as this borer moves on in this progressive front so these you know all these tree pests and pests in general they operate in different ways so and how we react to them you know is different